Yeah, okay. So what I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna have you step up on the stool, all right? So go ahead, step up on the, on the stool. There we go. Nice and balanced. So next, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to hand you these weights and I want you to hold your arms out like this. So hold your arms out like this and grab onto these weights here. And next, I'm gonna give you a light spin. So you're gonna go spinning around, all right? And so what I'm gonna have you do is when you're comfortable, slowly bring the weights into your body. And you're gonna change your distribution of mass. You're going to change your angular, or you're gonna change your inertia. Now your momentum's gonna stay the same, but we're gonna see what happens to your speed, all right? So you ready? So arms up, I'm gonna give you a spin. You ready? All right, so I'm gonna give you a light spin. Now pull your arms in. Whoa! What just happened? Do you want to do it again? I might spin you a little bit faster this time. You ready? All right, so arms up. I'm going to give you a, just a light spin there. All right, now put your arms in. Whoa! And take them out. Oh, wow, you almost stopped. Ruben, uh, why don't you hop up the scale, or the stool? Everyone give Ruben a round of applause. Thank you so much. Now, when Ruben brought his arms closer to his body, what happened? What, what, did you go faster or did you go slower? You went faster because you, oh, what, yeah, what happened? So did you see that? You went faster. So um, now Ruben went faster when he, when he decreased his angular, or when he decreased his inertia. And so his angular momentum stayed the same, but in order for his momentum to stay the same, he needed uh, something else to change, so his speed ended up changing. And so, as his inertia went down, his speed went up. And then when he uh, increased his inertia by changing, by spreading out the way his weight was spread out, uh, his speed decreased, but his angular momentum stayed the same. <laughs> now, one last really quick thing I want to do with the conservation of angular momentum is I have a bicycle wheel. Now I'm gonna do this demonstration myself because this takes a lot of practice, but everything that's spinning has angular momentum. And what I can do is I can step up on the scale and when I change the angular momentum of the wheel, my oh. own angular momentum will change as well. So, what is happening here? Now, do you have a suggestion of what's happening? Oh, I don't see. <laughs> so, well, can we sit back down? So we, we don't want you to hurt. Yeah, let's get off our scale, all right? Yeah, you can stay. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. So, I have, so, what happened? I imparted a force onto this wheel to change its angular momentum, and when I did that, the wheel exerted a force back onto me, changing my angular momentum. Now this is Isaac Newton's third law of motion, which states that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So basically that means that when I exerted a force on the wheel, the, ex uh, the wheel exerted a force equally back onto me. But here's the thing, we're still talking about conservation of angular momentum. So, me plus the wheel, our momentum right now is staying the exact same. As I change the momentum of the wheel, my momentum changes, but our momentum together stays the same. And that is conservation of angular momentum. Now, the last thing I want to show you with this bicycle wheel is, now how many people know how to ride a bicycle? You guys know how to ride a bicycle? So, how do you stay up on a bicycle? You balance? Well, does anybody have any other suggestions? What do you think? When is it easier to stay up? When you go faster or slower? It's easier to stay up when you go faster, right? Because the faster the wheels are spinning, the more angular momentum they have. And the more angular momentum you have, the more force it takes to change that angular momentum, kind of like when you have 
a top. Now we want to make sure we sit back down because we, we want to make sure you clear this. It's kind of like a top. It takes force to change the angular momentum of the wheel. And the angular momentum will change when the angle is changed. Yo, and you can see the wheels start to wobble around very slowly around its axis. And this is called precession. Now I'm gonna turn this top on its side. And we're gonna see why we stay up on a bicycle. Now if I pull my bicycle wheel up like this and I drop it, what do you think is gonna happen? It's, it's gonna fall, right? But I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm going to give my wheel a spin. I'm gonna dangle it here and then Yo. When I let go of it, it I forgot the happy right. Now, gravity is trying to pull it down. And as it pulls it down, the direction that the wheel is spinning actually jerks it to the side. Because again, the wheel has inertia and momentum. And so, this is actually how gyroscopes work. It takes a force to change the angle of the wheel. So, we can actually tell where a spacecraft or a airplane is pointed by using a gyroscope because the gyroscopes want to stay in the same direction. But of course, when I exert a force like a torque, try to turn the wheel down like this, it jerks the wheel over to the side. Now it depends on which way the wheel is spinning. Right now, the wheel is spinning clock, uh, counterclockwise for you guys. So when I spin it around, it spins counterclockwise when I look down on it, but for you guys when I spin it clockwise, or, oh, you're going, you're going clockwise, oh, yeah, so you're going counterclockwise here, and it spins counterclockwise, but when I make the wheel go clockwise, it spins the opposite direction, clockwise this way. But that's going to do it for that's our cool. angular momentum demonstration. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is electricity. So, so I'm going to use my Vandegraaff generator to demonstrate the properties of electricity. Now, how a Vandegraaff generator works is when I turn it on, there is a bunch of electricity, electric charge, generating on this shell, on the aluminum shell. And when I connect the Van de Graaff generator to the ground, oh, you get uh. a spark. And so look really, really closely. Oh. You guys see it? <laughs> Not really. All right, let's see if we can get another spark going. Oh, I saw that. It was like a tiny speck. Oh. Oh. Alright, let's see if we can get another spark going. You saw that we had a spark going because there was a bunch of electric charge gathering on this shell right here. And this shell is made out of aluminum. Now, aluminum is what we call a conductor. No, it doesn't drive a train. But uh, it is something that can allow electricity to flow through it really, really easily. So that is a conductor. Ele uh, electricity can flow through a conductor. Another example of a conductor is a copper wire or a lot of things that are metal. And also, you are a conductor because you're filled with a bunch of salt water, which is very conductive of electricity. Uh, now, the opposite of a conductor is what we call an insulator. Now, an insulator does not conduct electricity. In fact, the electricity kind of gets trapped inside the insulator, and this is what we call static electricity. So it's not flowing through the insulator. Now, we're going to use the example. My next volunteer is going to be Bob the Jellyfish. Now, he's made out of paper, which is an insulator. And when I put him on the Van de Graaff generator, and I turn it on, yo, look how it raises. We can see that Bob is 
starts to dance. And so the charge, there's a whole bunch of charge on the uh, aluminum shell, but when I reduce the charge, Bob's tentacles go down so I can make him dance around. Now there is an electric field emanating from this charged ball here, and that is repelling Bob's tentacles, which uh, have now generated static electricity. And so what we're gonna do next is we can do something similar, but I'm gonna use a, uh, he's okay, Bob's okay. I throw them around all the time. But I'm gonna use these conductive metal plates here, which are also gonna be charged up, and they're gonna have their own electric field, and we're gonna see what happens uh, now. Now, these are forces that you can see with your naked eye, but they are forces that are happening. So I'm gonna turn on the van graph. Yo! You guys wanna see it again? Yeah! Yeah! So, go ahead and place this back on here. Got a better angle this time? Watch him turn All on. right. So, you ready? It's crazy yeah. how it like, does it hurt here you? But go. then, like, if you turn it on, yeah. I think the first time worked. Uh, the first time worked a little bit better, but, you know, now I'm going to need a volunteer. And I need a volunteer with long, straight hair. No. So, um, what the like, hair like mine works really well, but I think your hair will Eat work it. really well. Now, yeah. are you okay with untying your hair? You want to go ahead and do that? Take that hair tie out of your hair. Eat it. Then... Take take the leg off. And then you can go ahead and come on up here. I'm just like move closer. <laughs> now we're gonna do something nah. really really fun. Oh. Go, Edith. Go. Come on up. Alright, Edith, so, Edith, you don't have a pacemaker inside your body, do you? No. Okay, great. We always like to make sure, because, uh, just for safety's sake, <laughs> but why don't you go ahead and step on this door and face the audience, alright? Okay, Edith, so, what we're gonna have you do is, I'm gonna have you touch the band graph. Oh, no. Oh. So, uh, you want to stand up and go Go ahead, stand on the band Go ahead, go ahead, go! Go ahead, go! You'll be okay, Edith. It's, it's actually really important that she does. I'm scared because this is actually like really dangerous. Because she won't get shocked because she's touching an insulator. Because all the energy is going into the insulator. But if she lets go of it, I'm gonna be scared, dude. You feel weird? Okay, so now, does it tickle? So now, what I'm gonna have to do is shake your head like this. Oh, yeah. Look at her head. And then, oh my goodness. Her hair. <laughs> is standing up. Wow. Oh my goodness. Her hair is standing up. Do you guys see her hair standing up? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Now, hold your other hand down and let go of all those packed of peanuts. Oh, oh, I'm scared. I just, I'm right <laughs> your hand. Now, oh wait, she has boots on. Okay, that's an insulator. Right okay, that's an insulator. Oh my goodness. Oh, oh. If, she was, if she would be touching the ground, yeah. uh, I think we'd go through her. She'd get shot. Alright, well, you're standing on a stool that is not connected to the ground, and so you have an electric charge, but then when you step back down, so go ahead and step off the stool. Now, Ooh, you hear that spark? Are you okay? Okay. You were, luckily, you were on the ground, so the shock wasn't that much. So I'm glad that was the case. But now your hair is starting to step, uh, go back down. But why don't you take a seat? Everyone give her a round of applause. Yay, you did.
Dita. All right, fun? now finally, we are going to do a chemical reaction. Hey. So, I have right here with me a chemical called hydrogen peroxide. Now, hydrogen peroxide, okay. peroxide, another name for it. Now, it's used for, it's you know, bleaching your hair or treating wounds. Now, another name for hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, otherwise known uh, for that's hydrogen peroxide. Now, H2O2 <laughs> sounds like another thing. What does H2O2 sound like? H2O. It sounds like H2O, right? Water. Yeah. And Which is water. Yes. So, what's another word for H2O? Water. Water. So, H2O is water. Now, that means that water has two parts hydrogen, that's the H2 part, and one part oxygen, that's the O part. So water is H2O. Now, hydrogen peroxide is a little bit different. We have an extra oxygen in the mix, so that is H2O2. That means two parts hydrogen and two parts oxygen. And what is happening with the hydrogen peroxide right now is a chemical reaction. Now, this H2O2 is breaking down into two things, water and oxygen. So H2O and O2. So this is constantly breaking down. This is a chemical reaction, but this is happening very, very slowly. So what we're gonna do tonight is we are going to speed up the reaction by using what is called a, a catalyst. catalyst. Now yes, in this sir. case, we have activated yeast as our catalyst. Now for uh, anything can be a catalyst if it, if it works. There's many different types of catalysts, but in this case it is yeast. And once again, a catalyst is something that speeds up a reaction to uh, separate this into water and oxygen, all right? So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna set up the reaction. Now, the most important thing, of course, is safety. So we're going to use, uh, we're going to wear our safety goggles while we're doing this reaction. And so I'm gonna start pouring in my chemicals here. Now I've got my hydrogen peroxide, my H2O2, and as I'm pouring it into the graduated cylinder, you notice something. What does this look like? It looks water? a lot like water, doesn't it? Now, yeah. is this water? No. No, but it looks like water. So, do we ever eat or drink our experiments? No. Never. We never eat or drink our experiments. Even if we think this is water, we do not drink it. All right, guys? That's very important. And like I said, this is uh, separating into water and oxygen. Water is a liquid that we drink, and oxygen is a gas. It's air that we breathe in. And we're going to catch all that air in bubbles using our dish soap. So I'm going to add a few drops of dish soap in the mix. And dish soap for our dishes. And then I'm going to add some food coloring so we can see the reaction a little bit better. Add some yellow in there. Okay, that's cool. Add a little as bit as you can zoom. Oh man. Okay. And I'm going to swirl it around. So we have a nice dark green which will lighten up as we do the reaction. I'm gonna make sure everything is mixed in. And now it's time to do the experiment. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna very quickly break up the hydrogen peroxide, the H2O2, into oxygen and water. But before we get going here, just one more thing. Never try this at home. All right, guys, okay. never try this at home. Okay. Try this at a friend's house because <laughs> it's easy, as I almost knocked down the graduating circle here. That would have been very entertaining. So, um, I'm gonna go ahead and do the reaction. Are you ready? Yeah. So, yeah. we're gonna count down in five, four, four three, three, two, two one. one. Oh, it is. I knew it. When I put my hands close to it, I'm not going to touch it, but it when burns. I feel it, 
I kind of feel a lot of heat coming off yes. of the elephant toothpaste. And I can feel heat because this is an exothermic reaction. Exothermic. The reaction releases heat as it goes. Now the opposite of an exothermic reaction is an endothermic reaction. That is a reaction that absorbs heat. Now, an example of an endothermic reaction that we all know of that also involves yeast is baking bread because the bread is undergoing a chemical change while absorbing heat in order to do so. But that is about it for uh, today's Steam Fest. Oh, Thank you guys yeah. so much for coming. You guys were great. Uh, it was a pleasure having you guys. Thank you so much. No, that, was, that was so cool. Oh, I'm back.